thing to those of you over on Chesterfield campus who are watching this, so thanks for with us. Just this past week, I had breakfast with a man who's from our church, and he's and his family are moving. They're uh, not retiring, but moving to a different part of the country. And he wanted to take me to breakfast to express his gratitude. I didn't know that at the time. I wasn't sure what the breakfast was for. And he said, I just want to say thank you. And I said, for what? He said, because this church changed my life. More specifically, God, through our church, changed his life. And I went on to ask him about that, and he said, in 2003, I started coming here with my wife, and she was getting involved, and I was getting involved, but I, I, I really didn't, I just tried to stay awake in services because I thought it was good for my marriage, is the way he put it. <laughs> really wasn't that committed. I didn't really understand who Jesus was or what he's done and what difference that really makes in my life. But he said, in 2003, at a service, I felt God speak to me, and I, he says, and now I'm just different. He said, I, I, I talk different, I think different, I act different. I'm a different husband. I'm a different father. He goes, I work different. I'm different in the workplace. He just said, I am different. And you've heard us use the phrase for where you are. I think he's a perfect description of that. Wherever you are on your faith journey, God wants to meet you there. But he doesn't want you to stay there. It's okay not to be okay. But it's not okay to stay that way. God wants to grow you, to develop you. And I just loved hearing that story. And in, we're in a series called Built to Last, looking at the book of Ephesians. It's an ancient letter written by the Apostle Paul to Christians living in Ephesus in modern-day Turkey, in Asia Minor. And for three chapters now, he's been hammering away at the gospel, that thing that my friend said he didn't get, who Jesus is and what he's done and what difference that makes. For three chapters, he's been pounding away at who Jesus is, what the gospel is, the glory of what God has done, the beauty of his grace, the power of his transforming spirit in our lives. And as my friend said, when you begin to grasp that, last week we saw that Paul's great prayer, that we would grasp together with all the saints how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God. When you begin to grasp that, everything is different. Everything is different. You could say that Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 is what God has done. And then we're going to begin to look at chapters 4 through 6 at what we should do in light of what he's done. You could say that one, chapters 1 through 3 are who we are in Christ. And chapters 4 through 6 are how we should live in the world. You could say that in the first three chapters tell us how God sees us in Christ. And the last three chapters are how the world should see Christ in us. So let's read, beginning with chapter 4, verses 1 through 16 of Ephesians 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to them. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, one of the benefits of reading a long passage like that is you get, you get kind of the broader picture of what we're being taught here, what we're being told here. Paul says, therefore I, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, urge you. Therefore what? 
the, remember we just talked about the first three chapters. In light of all this, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. Let me just give you a litmus to a little, a quick run through of the things he's saying, therefore about. Chapter 1, verse 3, blessed with every spiritual blessing. Verse 4, chosen before creation. Verse 5, predestined to be adopted as sons and daughters. Verse 6, redeemed by his blood. And verses 7 and 8, lavished with his grace. Chosen in verse 11, in accordance with his will. Verse 14, guaranteed to be an heir and have a full inheritance. Verse 13, sealed with the Holy Spirit. Made alive with Christ in chapter 2. Raised with Christ. Saved by grace. Created to do good works. Brought near to him. Made one. Made new. Given access by the Spirit. Made fellow citizens and heirs of God's house. That's just a small section of the first chapter and a half. That Paul's been talking about who you are, what you have, what he's done. And he says, therefore, I urge you. To live a life worthy of all of these things. The first thing he says, live worthy. I urge you, Paul says. I plead with you. I implore you. Live your life in light of all this that we've been talking about. Now, it's important we get something straight. Paul's not saying, live worthy or you'll lose all these things. He's not saying, you better live a worthy life, otherwise this will all be taken away. That would be to undo the gospel. What he's saying is, this is who you are. So live like it. This is who you are now if you're in Christ Jesus. You are a son. You are a daughter. You have been sealed. You have been chosen. You have been predestined and redeemed. And you are a member of his household. You do have a full inheritance. So live that way. I urge you, he says. Parents, how many of you have said to your children, or perhaps you heard from your parents, we're Frasers. We don't, well, you didn't hear Frasers, but you know. <laughs> we're the Smiths. We don't act that way. Or do you ever hear that? You hear, you, don't forget who you are, young man. Huh? What are they saying? Not if you don't misbehave, I'm kicking you out of the family. You don't lose being in the family, but this is who you are. This should define you. This should impact how you live. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. Therefore, a a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love. What does it mean then, specifically, to live worthy, to walk worthy? Paul repeatedly uses this phrase in 1 Thessalonians 2, walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you. In Colossians chapter 1, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord who saved you. In Philippians chapter 1, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel by which you've been called. This is not a, this is not a one-time thing here. Remember who you are. More specifically, remember whose you are. Remember who you belong to. I've shared this story before, but a number of years ago, a friend of mine who's moved away now came to faith in our church and began to grow in our church, and I got to know him, and he came from a rough background, a life of addiction, anger issues, but God was really working on him. He was changing. And there was, I won't get into the details, but there was some injustice done to a member of his family. And we met to talk and pray about it over coffee, and he was shaking with rage, wanting to get even wanting to do something about it, to exact vengeance on these individuals who had hurt someone in his family. Talking crazy talk about the things he was plotting. And I said, hey, you can't do that. He says, why not? Something's got to be done. Like literally shaking. And I said, because, and I don't, I didn't, I think the Spirit prompted me to say this. I didn't plan it ahead of time. I said, because, and I quoted to him 1 Corinthians 6, 19, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. In other words, you don't belong to you anymore. You don't call the shots in your life anymore. You belong to Jesus now, and he calls the shots, and you, can't, you don't get to act that way. Remember whose you are. He said that simple statement, you're not your own, just the scripture, you're bought with a price. The light came on for him. And he went, oh yeah, that's right. Paul says, walk worthy of your calling. Not to earn it. You've already been called. You've already been chosen. But live that way. Make the decisions in your life based on that central identity. Mom and dad, moms and dads out there, there's a big difference, isn't there? Between, say, when your child has messed up, 
And there's a difference between saying to them, what's the matter with you? What's wrong with you? Which implies what? I, you've got something deeply wrong. And saying to your child, honey, you're better than that. You're, you're much better than that. Both corrective statements, right? But one communicates something very different about identity, doesn't it? The simple truth is that you can either live your life in light of what you've done, your record. You can live your life in light of what's been done to you, the wounds and pains of the past. Or you can live your life in light of what's been done for you. Those are your choices. You can live based on your record. You can live based on what others have done to you. Or you can decide, I'm living my life in light of what has been done for me. I'm a child of God. I walk in that truth. Paul gives us three traits that illustrate what this should look like. He said, with all humility, gentleness, and patience. I, I find this fascinating. I was, I was thinking about this this week. Paul says, part of what it means to walk worthy is humbleness, humility, is gentleness, and patience. You know, this is incredibly relevant for us today. I've been talking to some pastor and theologian friends of mine, reading articles. There's a debate raging, perhaps you're aware of it, on whether or not the term evangelical is worth salvaging. It's, the word in our culture is not always a positive one, is it? It's a bit of a pejorative term. Evangelicals has come to mean something ugly, partisan, political, narrow. But the word actually, in, in its etymology, means of the evangel, of the gospel. Gospel people is what it means. You people of the gospel, the good news. But that's not what it means in common use in our culture. There are debates raging. Should we redefine it? Should we fight for it? Should we stand up and should we argue and should we debate against the, you know, the mainstream media or whatever? I'll just tell you this. The best apologetic in our culture for gospel people is for more of us to walk worthy to live lives worthy of the calling to which we've been called. That's far more effective than fighting on Facebook, friends. That's far more effective than the things that you post, is the life that you live. Walk worthy, Paul says. I've been telling you for three chapters who you are in Christ. Live that way. Let that get from your head into your heart and penetrate all of your life. That beyond every, anything else you do will represent your Lord in the world. Humility, gentleness, patience. In fact, the word for patience is a compound word in Greek. It's macrothemia. It literally means calm in the face of attack. It's used like, like, like somebody strikes you in the face and you don't get angry. You don't get knocked out either, apparently. Right? But think about this. In a, in a culture where everyone is shouting at everyone else, where everyone is attacking those who are not like them, Paul says to us, how relevant is this? Macrothemia, long-suffering, don't lash out, don't lash back. Walk worthy. You're a child of God. You're redeemed by the king. Your identity is not defined by what they say about you or the fact that they disagree with you. And then at the end of verse 2, Paul says... Bearing with one another in love. That phrase, one another, in English is two words. In Greek, it's one word, alelon. It occurs over 50 times in Paul's letters. He's always talking about one anothering. Love one another, forgive one another, confess your sins to one another, bear with one another, serve one another, build one another up. Over and over again, he's saying one another. What does this tell us? The point is, you cannot live a life worthy of the calling you've received by yourself. You can't live it in isolation, just you and your Bible, I'm going to live worthy on my own. There's no such thing. Living a life worthy of the calling you've received has to be done in community. You can't be loving without other people to love. You can't be patient without other people to bear. You, you can't be gentle with other people to be gentle toward. Live your calling means living in community. And that's why Paul moves then into the next thing, maintain unity. 
Live worthy, and then he says maintain unity. Unity with other Christians is a key part of what it means to live a life worthy. But I want to, it's very important that we get this straight because unity does not mean that diversity goes away. Unity is not a lack of diversity. It's not homogeny. It doesn't mean everyone agrees about everything all the time. Even this room. Over at Kesslinger campus. Over at Mill Creek campus this morning. Not everybody agrees. Newsflash, there are Republicans and Democrats in our church. <laughs> now you're looking around going, are they not near me? I hope, right? <laughs> Unity doesn't mean that diversity goes away. We have different socioeconomic backgrounds. We have different family backgrounds. We have different upbringings. We have different faith backgrounds. We have all kinds of differences. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Unity means what we share, what we have in Christ, the first three chapters of Ephesians, far outweighs, transcends all the things which would otherwise divide us and do divide us in our culture. Part of walk worthy is being united in those things that matter. It's, you know, we hear all the time, right, at election time, he's a uniter, she's a uniter, not a divider. That's not true. There's one uniter for the church, only one. Jesus is the great uniter, no candidate. That's what brings us together. What we share in Christ and through the gospel transcends our differences, our racial differences, our ethnic differences, our family differences, our educational differences, our economic differences, our personality differences. He's what unites us. Let me read verses 3 through 6 of chapter 4 again for you. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is a, a beautiful passage. In fact, Many scholars think this phrase that we're, there's sevenfold oneness, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, all those ones is an early Christian creed. That the early church would recite this. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, one spirit, one hope. I think what's, what's uh, important for us here is that God does not require unity from us without giving us the means by which we can have it. Did you, did you notice the trinities in those one statements? Did you catch that? In verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace, one body, one Spirit, one Lord, that's Christ. Whenever you see Lord in your Bible with a capital L, that's, the, that's a, a Greek word referring to the, the way they would refer to Jesus, the Son. Whenever you see Lord with all caps in your Bible, that's a reference to the Father, but that's neither here nor there. And then there's one God and Father of all. Father, Son, and Spirit are in there. In other words, our unity as Christians is rooted in His unity in Himself. Father, Son, and Spirit, unified, three persons, one God. And, and we are His body. We're unified because He is unified. I think this is... You know, in, in, the, in the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation in the early 16th century, the Apostle Paul, or excuse me, the, um, the, the Reformers had this cry. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Let me say that again. In essentials, unity. What are the essentials? The gospel. Who is Jesus Christ? What does his death and resurrection really mean? Who is God? What is God's plan for us? Like the essentials of our faith, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. What are the non-essentials? There's a lot of them, right? Forms of worship, style of worship. There's, there's, there's an endless list of things that are non-essential. Doesn't mean not important, but they're not essential. Liberty, there's room inside the family of Jesus for disagreement about things that aren't essential. You could have a different view about the end times than I do. You could have questions about roles in ministry that I don't have. We could disagree about certain interpretations if they're, if they're peripheral issues. But in essentials, unity. But in all things, what? Charity. 
We don't hate each other. We don't fight. We don't exclude. It is the one Lord, one hope, one spirit, one God and Father of all that unites us. I think this is really important. We're not united in spite of our different beliefs. We're united because of our same beliefs in one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Though that's what brings us together. Now, it's fascinating that in this point, Paul moves from unity to talking about spiritual gifts. He moves from the unity in Christ to diversity of gifts. He talks about a number of gifts. And by the way, every time you see lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible, there's not one exhausted lift, list where all the gifts are listed in one passage. There are, in different places, there are representative lists. The point is this. When you come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Spirit comes into your life, and among many other things that the Spirit does, he gives you gifts to be used to serve other believers in the church. Now, we won't get into this this morning because after Easter, we have a, a, a whole series this spring on the Holy Spirit. Who he is, what he does, and spiritual gifts will be part of that. We'll save the detail for then. Suffice it to say that Paul says, we are unified by the things we believe, Jesus Christ and who he is, one Lord, one faith, one Father. But we have diverse gifts. We're not the same. And all those gifts are for, used for what? What's the point of all these gifts? What's the point of all the stuff around here? What's the point of all the serving and doing at Chapel Street Church? This is the third thing I want you to see. It's to pursue maturity. Pursue maturity. The ultimate goal and purpose for all of this is that we would become mature. Let me read to you verses uh, 13 and 14. Actually, I'm going to begin with verse 12, which will not be on the screen. Paul says, To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood or adulthood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. Notice Paul says we. I, just, I, I did not notice this before. He doesn't say you. He doesn't say that so that you will grow up, so that you will become mature. He says we, meaning it's a collective thing, and he's identifying himself. If the Apostle Paul can say that he, too, is like a spiritual child, then I'm going to guess none of you are all that mature yet, despite how you may think of yourselves. The point of it all is that we would grow up to become mature in Christ. When you're born again, when you trust in Jesus Christ, Jesus says to Nicodemus in the Gospels, right, you must be born again. Who can go back into his mother's womb, Nicodemus said. That doesn't make any sense. He's talking about a new spiritual birth. The same way when you're born physically, you don't come out a fully functioning, mature adult, do you? You have some growing to do. Spiritually speaking, it's not different. No matter how much life experience you have, how much education you have, when you come to faith in Christ and you're born again into his, by his grace, you're like a newborn baby, spiritually speaking. You have some growing to do. And I know there are many of us who are a bit stunted in our spiritual growth. We're a little stuck. Some of you are still spiritual toddlers or adolescents. Sometimes I am. Paul says we, like newborns, must grow and mature. And I've not seen this before, but there's such a strong connection in verse 13 between unity and maturity. Let me read verse 13 again for you. Until we attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature adulthood. Isn't that interesting? Unity leads right into maturity. Meaning, you're not a mature Christian unless you experience unity with other believers. If you're living your life, I know a lot about the Bible and I've been saved and I trust Jesus, but I can't stand that person and I have a grudge against this person and this person hurt me and I won't trust them again and I don't like that group of people at our church and they are ridiculous in what they believe and I don't like the... You're not mature. If you're walking around with junk against other people in God's family, that's the sign of immaturity. 
Now, I'll just say two things about this, this unity and maturity thing. Number one, don't be shocked by the spiritual immaturity in others. Paul says it. We all have to grow up. We all have some growing to do. So don't get all twisted up and angry and shocked when you see other people in the family of God who are acting in immature ways. You should have grace for them. Number two, don't tolerate or accept spiritual immaturity in yourself. When you see it in your life, it's not okay. We get those flipped, don't we? We're very tolerant and accepting of our own immaturities and very intolerant and unaccepting of other people's immaturities. It should be the other way around. When I see immaturity in somebody else, I should say, I, I get it. We've all been there. We all have growing to do. I've got growing to do. When I see it myself, I should not say, oh, well, that's just who I am. Verse 14, Paul says, when that begins to happen, you'll no longer be children tossed to and fro on the waves. This is an interesting image, isn't it? By every wind of doctrine, he says. Deceitful teachings and human cunning. This is so critical today. I had a whole thing written out that I scratched out because I thought it might make people angry. <laughs> Listen, so many people come to me with things they've re read or heard, and it's spiritual garbage. One of the things Paul says about immaturity is you're not discerning. You can't tell truth from error. You're easily swayed. So let me just say it this way. Just because it's on Oprah's book list or because the author has a billion followers on social media does not mean it's truth. Does not mean it's good theology or spiritually good for you. It might be popular. It might be winning lots of con converts in our culture. But it doesn't mean it's healthy for your soul. One of the marks of spiritual immaturity is not only do I have issues with other people, but I can't really discern what's rooted in God's word, what's true, and what's just cool and new. That's why I like to read dead guys. They sort of stood the test of time. This is why he says, we grow up in the knowledge of the Son of God. Well, where is that found? Where is the knowledge of the Son of God found? In his word. Let's become people of the book. Not reading books about the Bible until we've read the Bible. Read the word of God, the primary source. Make it part of your, your every day of your life. Get some of God's word into your life. If you're not doing that, start doing that. If, you're, if you have no input of the word of God other than what you take away on once, for an hour on Sunday morning, that's not enough. I mean, hopefully it's good, but it's not enough. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, like newborn infants, we long for the pure spiritual milk. By it, we may grow up into salvation. Same image, right? Like spiritual infants, we long for good food, spiritual milk, so we could grow up into our salvation. Let me read verses 15 and 16 now for you. Paul says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now there's a lot in here, but that first phrase, speak truth in love, is so important. I want to focus on that phrase. Rather, Paul says, speaking the truth in love. Now he says rather, right? So we will not be children tossed to and fro in the waves, deceived by every new thing that comes down the pipe. Rather, we'll speak the truth in love to each other. This is a central practice of spiritual maturity, speaking the truth in love. I'm not always that good at it. And, and we fall off one side or the other on this. I, I, you, you could probably divide us up into two camps. Those on the love side, and those on the truth side. It's a continuum, I know. But it, it, it means holding two commitments in tension with each other at the same time. Number one, committed to absolute honesty. To the truth and to speaking truthfully. And number two, to absolutely committed to the other person's ultimate good. That's love. In other words, love without truth 
is not loving. Many of you, many of us, well, I, yes, it's true about them, and they probably need to hear it, but listen, if I tell them, I know how they're going to react. I know what they're going to say. They're going to get angry. They're going to get defensive. Or I'm going to hurt them, and then they'll be crushed, and I'll feel guilty. I'll either feel bad or guilty, or it'll, I just don't want to deal with that. You're not loving. Why? Because what is love? Love is the desire for the other person's good. And you're not telling the truth because you're worried about how you'll feel. That's not loving. Love without truth is not loving. It's just nice. And C.S. Lewis famously said, God did not come to make us nice people, but he came to make us new. Speak the truth in love. But on the other hand, truth without love is not actually very helpful. Some of you need to hear this. You're, I don't mind telling people the truth. They need to hear it. And I like that. Let them have it. If there's no love, if your, if your truth-telling is not motivated by this deep desire for their ultimate good, you only harden their heart to you and to what you're saying. They can't hear it. Because they can tell it's not coming from a place of care or concern or compassion. You just want to be right. You just want to win the fight. You just like putting people in their place. And that's not loving. <laughs> Last night, we're driving home from my daughter's uh, basketball game down in Bloomington. They lost in the conference championship by two. And you you thought I lost the way I was driving home. <laughs> I was worked up and I was unhappy and I was crabby and I kind of snapped at my son who was in the back seat, you know, and he was just being a good brother, went along for the ride. And my wife said, you're acting like a two-year-old. <laughs> Spiritual children, right? Spiritual children. We all need to grow up. No, I'm not. This is what two-year-olds say. No, I'm not acting like a two-year-old, <laughs> right? That's, yes, you are. <laughs> I didn't want to hear it. I needed to hear it, but I know that my wife loves me. She, didn't, she was irritated, but she didn't say that to get me. She didn't say that to put me in my place and to be right. She said that because she wants better for me. Speak the truth in love. You will not be uh, grow up into the fullness and maturity as a Christian unless you have people in your life who love you, but they love God more, and therefore they'll tell you the truth. They'll tell you the truth about you. And you can do the same for them. We need that so desperately in our lives. I need it. And, and really, friends, the gospel is the ultimate example of speaking the truth in love, isn't it? Think of what the gospel is for a minute. What's the gospel? What's the cross say? It says you're so sinful, you're so broken, you're so lost that the only way God could save you is to die for you. That's the truth about you. There's no easy way to save you, friends, because you're a mess apart from Christ, and so am I. That's the truth. That's the hard truth. Before it's good news, the gospel has to be bad news. But in love, God sent his own son into the world, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for you. Speak the truth in love. The gospel does that to us, doesn't it? It says, you're a mess. This is the truth, friends. You can't save yourself. But here's the love. God knows, and God will do it for you. That's the first three chapters of Ephesians, and we need to do that for each other. At the cross, we see the depth of God's love, the truth of our condition, and the depth of his love for us. I want to go back to the opening question. What does it mean to live a life worthy of the calling you've received? This week, I received a, somebody's little, little note under my door, and I get a bunch of notes, and I, I put it on the side of my desk and thought, oh, I'll read that later. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to it until Friday. And I pulled it out. It was from a good friend, and even know, Rhonda O'Brien in our church. She and her family attend the Mill Creek campus now. And she had written this in her journal, a story about her husband, Ken, and I got her permission to share it with you, and I think it perfectly illustrates what it means to live a life worthy of the calling. On Saturday, April 8, 2017, the phone rang in our home, and I only heard one side of the conversation. This is Ken. Great. Wonderful. I'm so glad you made it home. Thank you for calling. Yes, yes. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. I asked Ken, who was that? Oh, a man from Nigeria, he said. On Thursday, April 6th, Ken flew to London and back to O'Hare the next day for a quick business meeting. As he was walking through O'Hare to board his plane, he noticed a man standing in the walkway as travelers scurried along, maneuvering around him. He stood alone, confused, lost, dirty. 
Ken stopped and asked him if he could help him. Because of the man's heavy African accent, it took three times for Ken to understand that he was trying to go to Nigeria. Ken began giving him directions to get to the international terminal. From Terminal 3 to Terminal 5, go here, take the escalator, take the tram. Finally, Ken stopped repeating directions, held out his hand and said, let me see your ticket. The man and Ken were actually on the same flight. He was flying to Africa through London. Ken said, come with me. As they approached the security line, the man's eyes got big because of the line and the complexity, but Ken went to the magic wall door that opens at O'Hare for flyers like him. He was greeted by the man at the podium, hello, Mr. O'Brien, and Ken said, hello, he's with me. The door opened, both men walked in for a private check-in and on to the next hidden door in front of the security line again, he's with me. At this point, the man was directed to a separate line and he said goodbye to Ken. While the man began emptying his pockets, Ken walked on through his line easily and he realized this guy probably didn't know what to do or how to get through security. So he turned around and went back to security to find him and the man exclaimed when he saw Ken, you came back, you came back. Ken had planned on stopping to get his shoes shined, a treat he often avails himself of at the airport. He asked the man, would you like to get your shoes shined? The man said, no, no, no. Ken acted out that it would be his treat and he would pay. The man shrugged and nodded and began to untie his shoes. Ken said, no, no, leave your shoes on. He told the shoe shine man, he's with me. The man picked up his phone and made a call, and although Ken couldn't tell what he was saying, he was speaking in an African language, he could tell the man was excitedly telling somebody on the other line that he was getting his shoes shined. <laughs> they proceeded on to the Admiral's Club, and he said to the man at the door, he's with me. The concierge said the Admiral's Lounge was too crowded. They should go to the International First Class Lounge. Ooh. <laughs> again, again, Ken said, he's with me, and they entered the lounge together. They spread the, international, the spread of the International First Class Lounge is even better than the Admiral's Club, and Ken asked the man if he was hungry. The man said, no, no, sheepishly. Ken motioned for him to help himself, that it's okay. He can do anything he wants. Meanwhile, Ken needed to take care of some business, so he got on his computer, and suddenly he heard a commotion behind him. He saw the man with a full plate of food and a lady by the arm saying, he pay, he pay. <laughs> Ken understood what was happening. He apologized to the lady, and he says, don't worry, he's with me. He reassured the man that he could eat whatever he would like to eat. Eventually, it was time to go to the gate. The line was long. pre boarding had not yet begun. The concierge was at the gate waiting for Ken. Hello, Mr. O'Brien. Would you like to board now? Apparently, Ken O'Brien boards before military. People in wheelchairs, the elderly. And this is, I want to fly with Ken. And Ken said to the person at the gate, he's with me. All the man could say the whole time from the lounge to the gate and to the boarding was, I love you. I love you. I love you. And Ken thought, this has got to stop before we get on the plane. <laughs> this is what Rhonda writes at the close of her journal entry in the story. This is me. I am the man. Dirty, lost, alone, confused. Jesus comes to me. She's with me. Leads me, and all I have to do is follow him. Just stay with him. She's with me, stays with me, sees to my every need, gives me his sweetness, things I, I don't even deserve far beyond what I ask. A table spilling over. The sweetness of Jesus all along the way. She's with me. He escorts me. She's with me. He sees me safely home. She's with me. My only response, I love you. I love you. I love you. I read that Friday in my office, I, I, I almost couldn't take it. Paul says, live a life worthy of the calling you've received, not out of obligation and duty, and you better get this right, but do you realize who you're with? Do you realize? Jesus says, God says to you through his son Jesus, he's with me, she's with me. All Paul is saying is live that way, live with him. Why do you keep wandering off? Lost in the airport, right? He's with me. She's with me. Let's pray. Father God, your grace is really too much for us sometimes. All the time, if we're honest, we're just not in touch with it. I pray that out of the riches of your glorious inheritance, the power of your spirit, the beauty of your gospel, 
you would help us to live our lives worthy, to walk worthy of the calling we've already received, to live in light of who we are, and more importantly, of who you are. We thank you. We ask you by your spirit to help us speak the truth in love to each other, because we need both, truth and love. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you perfectly are both. We pray these things in your name and for your sake. Amen. Let me leave you this morning with Paul's great benediction from Ephesians chapter 3, which we learned last week. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.